fabulous museum that he started and took several years to even get it off the ground. And there's still finishing parts of it. He'll update you on that. But it's terrific. Memories of History. Um, this is titled the um, Miami Museum, a military museum, and uh, Veterans uh, Memorial. And it's located right by the Miami Dade Zoo. And on the other side is the old rail railway museum. And he did it for the children and for history. And concern that, uh, I, and I am a former teacher, reading specialist, but I was in classrooms a lot. And I always felt overwhelmed for social studies, teachers teaching history. How do you decide how much to spend on this war and that war? How do you put it all together and, and have these young people growing up and understanding associations between countries and histories and things like that? And so something like this is an addition to uh, children's education and even to us as adults. I mean, every time I turn around, I would hear things even from my own father who was in World War II about things that went on. So uh, and I definitely encourage you all to eventually get to uh, the museum. Maybe we'll get a bus down there or something yes. like that. Uh, as well, or a carpool and things like that. But I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Anthony Atwood. Hi. My name is Anthony Atwood. Uh, I was in the service, uh, I was in the Navy. Uh, I hold a PhD in history, and it has been my distinction to be the founder or creator of the forthcoming Miami Military Museum and Memorial. Uh, you all, if you didn't know it, there was a vital military installation here on the Key during World War II. During War, World War II, the lighthouse was darkened. It was taken over by the military, and it was used for triangulation. It was used for triangulation because if you have three radio receivers at different locations, and the enemy sent up a signal, and it was heard by all three, you could triangulate the distances, and you could discover where they were. And it's an, a very important thing because the enemy was right off the coast of Florida. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to talk about. That and the, the Emerging Military Museum. Und so, what we have here is, uh, those are our three uh, uh, service members, Floridians. Uh, they were, uh, uh, the pilot was a fellow named Pugh. He went to the University of Florida, and obviously you can tell that he was, uh, uh, what his allegiance was uh, academically. <laughs> the reason why we want to remember them is because uh, April 19th of 1944, they went up from New Guinea on a bombing mission against the enemy. These are just homeboys from Florida. And they have yet to return. They are among the 73,000 Americans who were lost in World War II and for which there is no accounting. They either went down with ships, jungles, deserts, all over the world. So. Uh, it behooves us to remember them because of uh, the way the world is. So if you would, sir, let's look a little bit, and if we have a technical advisor that could dim a few of the lights, just uh, not great, but if, sure. Okay, so everybody knows Florida, right? You know you're on the, the, the wonderful tip of it. What Florida has, it has three things. It has location, location, and location. If you are uh, the maritime, some of the most important maritime passages on Earth are uh, athwart the Florida Peninsula. You have got the one of the the waters of the world because it spins. The water comes in this way from the Atlantic. It fills the Caribbean, rushes through this passage called the Yucatan Channel, fills up the Gulf of Mexico goes all the way up to Montana, or all the way up to uh, the Great Lakes, and pushes its way back out through uh, the Florida Straits. 
So right here in our neighborhood are some of the most important sea passages on the planet. You've got the Florida Straits leading into the Gulf, the Yucatan Passage likewise. You've got the Panama Canal, which incidentally was created in the early 1900s and finished. Uh, it, it was really important during World War II. And you've also got the mouth of the Mississippi River. We tend to forget, but all maritime traffic to the heartland of the U.S. going in or going out has to go through the Mississippi. And the nearest flag country guarding that passage is the Florida Peninsula. Next slide. So it's got some real importance going around 1939, 1940. We already mentioned uh, commerce to and from the West Coast. Everything to California goes through Panama Canal, practically, unless you're going to go three times harder around the, the uh, Cape Horn. Also, you've got two products that were really important in World War II. One, oil. It's still important. In 1940, come on in. Sorry. We just rambling away. We're just banging away on, on our heritage. During World War II, the United States imported no oil from anywhere on the planet. All of our oil was locally. It came from Texas, Texas tea. And so all of your oil going around the world to the manufacturing centers, Pittsburgh, uh, uh, all of those places, it had to go from Texas past Florida. Very important. Another uh, strategic material, in addition to oil, is something called bauxite. Uh, bauxite it is an ore. It's dug out of the ground. When you melt bauxite, when you heat it up, it melts and it becomes aluminum. Aluminum is the most <coughs> necessary ingredient for anything that flies. Your aircraft are not made of steel, they're not made of iron, they're not made of rocks, they're made of aluminum. So if you're going to have aircraft, you've got to have bauxite. And bauxite comes from South America and Jamaica. So to get bauxite to the factories where it's smelted down and create aircraft, again, you pass with the force. So you've got a, a lot of reasons to look at Florida for, for military uh, purpose. And there are other reasons, and we'll go into them. In 1937, uh, there were four military installations in Florida. Okay, uh, Pensacola, uh, good old base, been around for a long time. Uh, it's where pilots were trained uh, for the Navy and the Marine Corps. We trained, back in the day, we trained about 100 pilots a year. Uh, there was a place called Eglin Army Airfield, uh, which the, the community of Eglin had uh, uh, given the land to the military. It, it was, the Depression was still on. And so the military came away with the, the largest military base in the inventory. Uh, Eglin is the size of, is half the size of Rhode Island. It's enormous. Okay, there was a National Guard camp at uh, Camp Foster on the St. Johns River in Jacksonville. And the final military installation was at Opalaka. There was a, a reserve station there because the aviation inventor, Glenn Curtis, invented, uh, well, to some he invented the aircraft not to Wilbur and Orville Wright. The two, of, the two groups sued and countersued and quarreled with each other for their whole lifetimes. But whether he was the initial inventor or simply created such important aspects as brakes, uh, he was a, a, an aviation inventor of the first order. And he donated the land for the military to have a base in Opelot. Next slide. Now, something else was happening in, in 1937. Uh, <clears throat> the Japanese uh, samurai class had taken over 
the government and were all uh, pressing to create a great, what was euphemistically called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Really what it was was the Japanese Empire. Uh, and to do that, the Japanese uh, Empire, as differentiated from today, we have a democracy, uh, they determined that they were going to conquer China. So they attacked uh, the capital of China at that time, which was Nanking. Uh, the United States had to do with China in those days. There were thousands of uh, missionaries in China. There were businessmen in China. Herbert Hoover had been a mining engineer in China. So the United States had gunboats at our territory of the Philippines, which was right across from China, and we sent a gunboat to the scene of these hostilities. Not to join the hostilities, but to rescue Americans who were there. The United States, unlike many nation states, the United States seems to care about its people, and it does what it can to help them so when they get in trouble. Uh, so this gunboat went to Nanking on the Yangtze River, and the idea was that they would rescue Americans who had been caught up in this conflict. The decks were painted with big red, white, and blue uh, flags so that anyone would know that they were not a belligerent but on humanitarian mission and neutral. A couple Italians had gotten caught up in this fighting, and they asked to come aboard for refuge. And they were granted, uh, they were allowed to come on board. They brought with them their camera because, uh, like Terry over in, in the corner, they, they were uh, video people. They, they were, uh, the two Italians were filming the hostilities for the, the when you, used to go to a movie, there'd be a little newsreel beforehand about what was going on, cafe, whatever. So they had their cameras. What happened next is the Imperial Japanese Air Forces attacked our gunboat. They attacked our gunboat on the 12th of December. Uh, and, and this sailor, this is not made up, uh, he's going to action stations in his skimmies, because the attack was surprised, it was not expected, and uh, they sank our gunboat and killed three sailors, wounded 40. The rest of them got ashore and were rescued by uh, Chinese nationals. The two Italians were among those who were rescued, and they swam ashore with their can of film. And that can of film, that's a still from it, that can of film made its way to Shanghai and then by a clipper ship, a Pan, a Pan Am clipper, made its way to the United States and it made its way to the desk of Franklin Roosevelt, the president, who watched it and then censored it. He cut out 30 feet of film because although the Japanese Empire had apologized that they did not no, it was a United States ship. In the film, you could see their aviators at such close distance that you could tell if they were wearing glasses or not. When you're that close, folks, they could not have mistaken the American flags painted on, on the ship. So although they apologized that it was a misunderstanding, they didn't know, the sad fact is they did know and they bombed and sank us uh, regardless. Next slide. Now Roosevelt, he censored the film and it went out through the public. The Navy wanted to declare war. Roosevelt said no. Uh, but that, you can still see it on Google if you Google the Pan Am incident. He set, accepted their apology because we had the 17th smallest military in the world at that time, and he had to accept their apology. Never know. There he is. He's a nice guy. Right. Let's take a uh, let's next slide. 
Well, he may have been a nice guy, but he wasn't all that nice of a guy. He hunted sharks. And he hunted sharks from the deck of, of Navy ships. And if a president wants to go fishing on a Navy ship, it's his Navy. Uh, he's the only one who did. You can recognize a couple of aspects uh, of his leadership. One, he's uh, fairly strong. Number two, he's sitting down. We'll talk about that. Number three, if you notice, the sailors are all in t-shirts. I guarantee you, if you're in the Navy and the Commander-in-Chief is on board, you're not going to get into a t-shirt unless it's okay with him. Okay, so clearly he, he, uh, he had some simpatico with the troops, and yet the officer of the deck, that's the fellow on the left. He's, he's still in his monkey suit. Uh, so although he was relaxed, he, he, uh, President Roosevelt was not uh, careless. OK, so uh, next slide. Okay, he started the rearmament of America from that time. Uh, Florida interested him because it had a very small population. Uh, yeah. It also interested him because if you're going to build a first class military, you got to have somewhere to do it. Okay, and among other uh, uh, promising locations, Florida had flat land. Flat, now remember, aircraft must have flat land to land. Uh, and it had a lot of flat, empty land. It had unlimited access to the sea right out the window. And it doesn't matter where you are in Florida, you're, you're never more than an hour from the sea. So you can train and do any kind of uh, naval training you want. Uh, Year-round good weather, so if you're going to train pilots, they can train. Uh, I, the largest national forest in America at the time what does it take to turn a national forest into a bombing range? The stroke of a pen. And if you're the commander in chief. And he was. And it, it, we, he created bombing ranges overnight. And as well, it, uh, ground forces can do most kinds of, of military training in Florida. You want jungles? We got jungles not far from here. You want forests? We got forests. You want beaches? We got beaches. We don't have mountains. Okay? We don't have desert. But other than that, it's uh, it was pretty ideal for, for military training. Okay, moving on. Next, Roosevelt visited Florida numbers of times by train. He would uh, tell people he was going fishing, and he would get on the train, come to Florida, go to Fort Lauderdale, Miami. Uh, Pensacola, wherever, and what a coincidence, here's a destroyer or a cruiser waiting to take him fishing. Next slide. Okay, he created the Hepburn Commission, which was to look into the United States, uh, security, and, and offer uh, uh, proposals, recommendations. Next slide. <clears throat> the Hepburn Commission proposed uh, breaking up the, the coast of the U.S. into districts, uh, and uh, the seventh district, uh, former Navy. Today, the largest Coast Guard district in the inventory is the seventh Coast Guard district. They are headquartered on Brickell Avenue, and before it was the seventh Coast Guard, it was the seventh Naval district. Navy and Coast Guard are like buddies. Uh, so, next slide. A couple of realities of military geography. I, I, I talk to, to students, I talk to cadets, all sorts of folks. So j just something about military geography. <clears throat> they particularly like the Jacksonville area. Uh, and remember I showed you that slide of, of the campground with the National Guard? Well, the National Guard surrendered that campground. It became Naval Air Station Jacksonville. The uh, the Army, in, in lieu of that, got a place called Camp Landing, which is 
more acreage than, than you could imagine. Uh, they also created Mayport, uh, right at the mouth of the uh, St. John's River, uh, and down below at a place called Banana River was, next slide. The reason why they were interested in Florida, although it had uh, some promising elements, also there was an emergency going on in Europe because, as you know, uh, it, the trouble had just percolated and percolated until it blew sky high by 1939. Now, in 1940, the problem was almost impossible to contain. Uh, the France had been conquered. Uh, the, the French built a, a bit of a wall between them and Germany. They called it the Maginot Line. Uh, but they didn't build it through Belgium because Belgium was neutral. However, if you're a, a, a power-mad dictator, you're not going to... Well, he went around the wall. He went through Belgium. What's a dictator to do if you... And what else? If you want worldwide control. France fell in six weeks. Now remember, Russia at that time was allied to Germany. There was a secret agreement between those two murdering dictators, Stalin and Hitler. They were allied. Britain was on the ropes. London was being bombed on a daily basis. If London had fallen, who would have been left? The new United States of America. Now how do you get at the United States of America? You go down to French West Africa, you cross at the Narrows, the Dakar Narrows, the Narrows of the Atlantic, where the two continents come closest together. And then you work your way up the Caribbean. Now, with, the, with places like uh, uh, the, the Caribbean nations, would they have stopped the Nazis? They no, they, they couldn't, even if they had wanted to. And some of them surely didn't. Some of those countries were, were pro-Nazi. So if you were the enemy, where would you land? Where would you end up? Miami Beach. You would end up on, on uh, Daytona Beach. You'd end up on those beautiful... Uh, easy going beaches of Fort Pierce. That's the reality that the United States military was looking at in 1940. If Britain fell, we would have been next, and that's how they would have come. Next slide. So, to uh, ward that off, or to defend against it, if it came, the Navy got heavily involved in Florida. Remember, we looked at an earlier map, there was like two, two bases. Well, they created 25 bases up and down the coast. Uh, to uh, People ask, well, ne next slide, let's, go, let's move on. Okay, the, air, the Army also got involved in Florida. Next slide. They got involved, they said, well, 1938, let's have a major base for each section of the continent to defend the continent. All right, this one was called the southeast area. Where would you have your base? You could have it in uh, Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana. Where do you think was put the, the base? Next slide. They chose Tampa. They chose McDill Air Base. Next slide. And it became, it's, it's there today, McDill Air Base. It was renamed from the Southeastern Base to MacDill in honor of an aviator. The Army, which has always been bigger than the Navy, they built 42 Army airfields. That's, that's a lot of bases. Uh, and people ask, they ask me today, they said, well, where did they go? Where did all those bases go? They didn't go anywhere. Miami Army Airfield was renamed in 1948, Miami International Airport. Oh my gosh. Fort Lauderdale <laughs> Naval Air Station was renamed Fort Lauderdale International Airport. Morrison Field was renamed 
West Palm Beach International Airport. All of them are still there. Now the ones, uh, some few that were out in the hinterlands, they became college campuses. But all of those bases are still there. So if you ever wonder, how does it afford to get to be aviation centric? Next slide. Now you know. There, there it is. It's, it's part of our heritage. Next slide. So uh, even the British came to to uh, learn how to fly here. We had Embry Riddle was training people. The name, the army, uh, people were flying all over the skies. Next slide. And there's some of those aviators. Winston Churchill's nephew was among the aviators trained right here in Miami. Next slide. Okay, so Florida's place in the world, think about it, and then move on to the next slide. Uh, fortunately, one of the, the greatest stroke of, of luck that the United States ever had was Hitler and Stalin broke up. <clears throat> They had a falling out, and then as dictators would do, Hitler made a secret uh, a surprise attack on Russia. Okay? He could have just as easily gone the other way and landed here. But instead, thank goodness, uh, he, he went against Russia. Uh, not too long after that, uh, you know what happened to Pearl Harbor, in which case, next slide, it was impossible us to remain out of it. Okay. The route that, that the enemy would have taken, uh, a, an airstrip is neutral. All it, it doesn't care, it doesn't even know what nationality your airplane is. Uh, is. If you've got an airstrip, an airplane can land on it. So the United States built airstrips with Pan American all the way down to Brazil and then airstrips uh, across uh, to Africa. Next slide. Then across Africa all the way to the Middle East. The reason is, is there's in those days, propeller-driven aircraft, it was really difficult to fly across the Atlantic. Practically impossible. Uh, Lindbergh did it. He got lucky. His airplane was made out of linen. And, and, and blew him across one guy. If you're talking many, many flights, bombers and whatnot, the, the, the northern route is quite dangerous. Blizzards, snows, all of that. And if you, if you ditch, you're, you're landing in freezing waters. Uh, the other way is the long way, which I mentioned, which goes, next slide. Okay. Anybody know what Main Street this is? Downtown Miami. Yeah, yeah right. There's the, <laughs> there, there's the Olympia Theater. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so the United States, instead of the enemy coming to us, we were able to go to them. Next slide. The first of our aviation attacks uh, was the Panama <coughs> Raid. You've heard of that. That was they trained for it at Eglin in North Florida. The, the a aviation importance uh, of Florida was, su was such that Roosevelt himself took the route. He called the reporters to him, uh, to his office in Washington, and he lied to them. He said, I'm going to go to Hyde Park and, and chill. I have to think about this war, and I don't know what's going to happen. So come to the train station and see me off. And they did. They went to the train station, waved, and the train went north until night fell. And then out in Pennsylvania, the train stopped. A train doesn't need to turn around. It just goes either way. And the train, when it started again, was heading due south. And uh, it came all the way to Miami. It uh, passed through the train station. And uh, uh, US-1, the, the train tracks used to go right along it. And right about it at Vizcaya, the train came to a stop, and big surprise, there's uh, 15 cars with Secret Service agents. They carried Roosevelt. Incidentally, he was crippled. He would not have been allowed to join the master race. 
he would have been euthanized, and he knew that. Roosevelt was carried to the Secret Service car, uh, so were the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. What a surprise. They were there. And they drove him to Coconut Grove, where he got on a Pan Am Clipper, which was the Mr. Jones and his chartered party. And they flew down to Brazil, across to Africa, and up to our troops who had landed in North Africa. Yeah. And, and then he came back the same way. Next slide. Where the aviation, where it, where it came to an end, was in China. Uh, right over here, who, who knows, there's a certain body of uh, a land mass. It's called the Himalaya Mountains. The Himalayas are the largest, tallest structures on the planet, and for the aviation people to fly over them was a tremendous feat. It was called flying the hump. Uh, so many aircraft did not make it that the pathway was, was known as the aluminum trail because these airplanes would simply crash on their way across the mountains. The reason why they did this was because uh, China had to be kept in the war. China was an ally. Uh, the majority of the Japanese land forces were in China, and if China surrendered, those troops would have been freed up to go to the Pacific. And we were already having enough god-awful trouble conquering those Pacific islands. We didn't need any more of the enemy. We needed less of them. So uh, one of the major missions of Florida was flying the hump. Every day, aircraft loaded with cargo would fly all the way down to Brazil, all the way across to Africa, all the way across to India, and then over the Himalaya Mountains to China. Next slide. I, I told you about the importance of the, the region from a nautical perspective. Well, the enemy, you could say what you want about the Nazis, but they were not stupid. They could read a chart, they could read a map as well as anyone, and they said, wow, this is important. Uh, next slide. And so they came here. Uh, Nazi U-boats came and attacked Florida, the Sunshine State. Every one of these dots here, that's the ship they sunk. Yeah. And now you Maybe it hits home a little better than when I mentioned that the lighthouse had been turned into a, a triangulation spot for catching enemy messages. We really needed to know where they were because they were just popping up and sinking our ships. Uh, the enemy submarines, and they had a field day. Next slide. That's just one of them that was sunk. Now you can see them. You know, they, they float past. Uh, they put a torpedo in them and, and let them sink. Uh, it was war. And next slide. So we had a lot of training. Even President Ken, later President Kennedy, came here. He was wounded in the Solomon Islands back in the day. And he was shipped back and he had to wait his turn for back surgery. So he wrote a desk uh, to keep us gain and train people in PT boats. Next slide. Okay, even the Cuban Navy got involved. Uh, the Cuban Navy sank one of these U-boats. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and here you are, you've got the two navies, the, the U.S. Navy and the Cuban Navy. And we were honoring them. Next slide. Uh, yeah, there you go. That. It's good to have allies. And this took place at, a, at what was called the Navy Subchaser School, uh, which was where Bayside is today. The next slide. Okay, there's a building. Hey, I'm trying to press on with this. The, uh, they built a base where the zoo is now. Back in the day, there was no zoo. It was simply a pine forest out in the boondocks. And they built a blimp base. Next slide. 
They built the, built a blimp base to help catch these enemy submarines because the blimps had radar, they had sonar, they had radio, they even had machine guns and bombs. So they hunted for these enemy submarines. Uh, next slide. This is just one of their, remember I mentioned Florida has something going on as far as its location. Whether you think about it or not, the people who run things, they have maps and they go, hey, these, next slide. Florida was also good, the beaches, a lot of ground troops uh, came here, over two million of them, uh, with major, major installations, next slide, because if you're going to have to go invade other countries, you come from the land, uh, from the water onto the land, you might want to practice first. All three of the divisions that landed in Normandy on D-Day trained in Florida first. Next slide. Uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's just a place to do it. Uh, next slide. Uh, Miami Beach was a training center. Why? Because you, there's no winter. Next slide. Uh, that's just more training. Next slide. We also built ships. The, the civilian population built 10% of, of the, the Liberty ships at these, these locations. Big shipbuilding. Uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, Joan of Arc Welding was part of it. Rosie the River. Uh, that's just, they even built ships out of cement. There were, there were 24 ships built out of concrete. And then they were floated across and landed off the beaches in Europe to be uh, breakwaters. So here are your pathways, and this was a critically important path. Remember, you didn't have mid-air refueling. You didn't have jets. It's all propellers, so the long way was the safe way. Uh, next slide. Oh, and by the way, what is it? To, the cargo plane was not invented by the military. It was invented by Eastern Airlines, a bigger airplane. Why? To carry mail, to carry cargo, to carry freight. But what does it take to turn a civilian cargo plane into a military cargo plane? Green paint. Uh, okay, got to move, 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 move around. Oh yeah, also, uh, it was a watershed experience for what in, in the days of the Trojan War was called the distaff half of, of humanity. Uh, the WASPs, the Women's Air Service pilots. Uh, next slide. And the wax. You know where these are, are, you know what the wax were. Okay, fine. Uh, Women's Army Corps. 28,000 of them trained here. And you know what street this is, don't you? That's Flagler Street. Press on. Okay. Uh, African American GIs from Florida uh, were at 20% of the African-American males in Florida join the military. That's a whole, but when you then subtract the elderly and the children, it's a huge number. And what did they do? Next slide. They built the Burma Road. Yeah, I remember, you remember when we talked about having to fly over the mountains? Okay, well, it took them years to do it, but they eventually built a road over those same mountains. Next slide. While everyone that could was in the military in Florida, and those who weren't were building ships, uh, and who was, who was picking the, the oranges? No, ma'am. No, the women were building ships. No, actually it was the prisoners of war. Yeah, who knew? Uh, there were 10,000 of them uh, were interned in Florida. Next slide. We had 25 prisoner of war 
Okay, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, there, was, there was one in, uh, you know where Dave Land is? Yeah, Dave Land was a prisoner of war camp. Back in the day. Uh, next slide. Alas, war is not one of the serious matter. Uh, people get killed and damaged uh, irreparably. Uh, next slide. Who were wounded were often flown back to the United States. Next slide. And where would they land? <coughs> Florida. And all these hotels. It was a, the, yeah. That's why it was became a hospital. So the cargo planes left from Miami International, loaded and was charged to ultimately fly over the Himalayas. On the way back, they picked up wounded because they, they were then empty and loaded up uh, wounded and flew them back right here to Florida. And uh, the hotels were all taken over to be hospitals. Next slide. Look at this guy. He was uh, the commander of the Army Air Forces. Major, major individual. Uh, Hap Arnold, he was a smoker. He had a heart attack. They said, you have to get some R&R, &R, rest and relaxation. Where do you want to be? In Florida. Yeah, and he was a golfer. So. <laughs> Yeah, he was uh, a time less right up there. Yeah, well, uh, next slide. Okay. On a more serious note, even, the pilot of the Enola Gay lived in, in a place called Little Shenandoah. Now, in Shenandoah, it's now called Little Havana. Uh, he grew up, that's where he grew up. And all of the, half of his crew were trained here in Florida. Next slide. And the other flight, one third of them were trained here in Florida. And the co-pilot, Alberry, went to Miami High. Yeah, huh, who knew? That building is the last uh, of the buildings. After the war, the community created a zoo. It was right down the street at uh, Crandon Park. Okay? They finally, they outgrew the need for the zoo, and they said, well, where can we put the zoo? And somebody had the bright idea to say, well, let's put it out at the old Richmond base on Coral Reef Road. And they said, well, who owns the land? And they said, well, the Department of Defense. So uh, the government, they petitioned Armed Forces, the Department of Defense, to grant them land from the old Flint base to be a zoo. And go figure, the military agreed. <laughs> and 800 acres were donated. That's why the, the zoo moved. Now there's a caveat. If we ever get such an emergency again, then, then there's an eminent domain, there, there's covenants that the military can boot the, the rhinos out. <laughs> First building, we had to move it to save it. Next slide. And here's some ruins uh, of the hangars, that tall thing there. Uh, the blimp hangars <coughs> burned down and only the cement was left. There, that's a train because in addition to the zoo, you also have a train museum. Now, this area right here, now go forward was this same area. Okay, press on. Uh, this building was used by the Navy in World War II, and then the military held on to it. It was just a forest. Uh, and in 1960, when you had the Castro Revolution, which changed everything in our, in our world, they said, well, we have to fight against this communist dictator. Where's the place where we can uh, set up a headquarters? And they said, well, what about down there in the boondocks, in the middle of that forest? And so this hangar, remember now, the zoo has, it's barely starting here in Key Biscayne in 1960. This place was headquarters for the CIA against, uh, for anti-Castro training of, of freedom fighters. And it was known as J.M. Wade. After the CIA moved out, 
Then they gave it to the Army Reserve, and it was a reserve center. And then they moved out in the late 70s, and they gave it to the Marine Corps. And it was a Marine Corps Reserve Center up until the 1990s, mid-90s. So it had about 50 years of military heritage, all the branches. Uh, but when we took it over, it was falling apart. The government, in their infinite wisdom, they sold it to us for one dollar. <laughs> but of course, we had to move it off their property onto the grounds of the zoo and restore it. Uh, next slide. Which has been uh, ten years. Yeah, I used to have <coughs> brown hair. Uh, next slide. At the building had a. Spe if you care about historic preservation, we hope to have classes on the subject there. Uh, there was asbestos, a common building material. Next slide. Lots of planning. Uh, lots of this has been going on. And, and our primary uh, patrons are Miami-Dade County. That means all of you have chipped in, whether you realize it or not. And the state of Florida. Okay. Next slide. <coughs> Yeah, you think saving an old building is easy? Uh, there, your tax dollars at work. And, and that's why this is a public service uh, announcement as much as anything else. I'm sure, I, I hope you do rent a bus to come down for the grand opening July 7th. Next, next slide. Uh, how much that you would not believe the, the detail that uh, county permitting and zoning, the things. See, you can't just paint it and say, oh, it's, it had to be stripped, restored, there's steel girders, and then we had to move it. The largest building moved in the state of Florida. Next slide. There it is getting ready to move. Next slide. And there it is pulling into its new home on the grounds of the zoo. And of course, we had our elected officials. We tied a rope to it, and at the other end, we had uh, um, Commissioner Diaz and Congressman Diaz Pilar. All of it, they were all pulling on it. So, you know, as if they were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. These guys are members of CABA. Next slide. That's the building, uh, the, the replica, the rendition before we started the restoration. We've had a lot of help from the Eagle Scouts, the Boy Scouts next, Miami Military Museum and Memorial, okay? Uh, the Cuban American Veterans Association, they built a monument. So, there, there's the building today. Yeah, it's kind of majestic, isn't it? Well, hold on here, Ed.